Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter. Welcome to the Daily Check-In for, uh, what is it? August 28th, 2020. It's Friday, which means we're talking about vault certifications. In this post, I am going to be talking about objective number five, vault certification secrets engines. This is a part two of a two part on this particular objective. So if you didn't watch last week's or you didn't listen to last week's, I covered a bunch of stuff around secrets engines in that episode. So that will really inform this one. So probably go back and watch that one. I'll throw a card up here to, to link to it real easily. What we're talking about here is how to achieve the vault certification. I am HashiCorp vault certified. Woot woot. Uh, I did during the beta exam when they were doing the tests, but it's valid. Uh, I actually helped write some of the questions later after I passed the exam. Uh, but so I kind of know what I'm talking about when it comes to this vault stuff. And I have a couple courses on Pluralsight too. Uh, but that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, in terms of housekeeping stuff, uh, the only thing I want to mention, and I think I've mentioned this uh, before, is that the Terraform certification guide I wrote with Aiden Army has been updated for Terraform 0.13. So if you are looking to get that certification as well, I've got a good certification guide for it, and it has been recently updated. So you can check that out. Links will be in the description. Also, I just wanted to talk about somebody else who's doing some really good work around HashiCorp products, and that's my buddy Brian. So I will put some links to his Udemy courses, and uh, he also has a certification guide. Uh, not a guide so much, but questions certification questions for Terraform and Vault. So you can combine all that stuff together and put it up in, into one nice package. If you're looking to get these uh, HashiCorp certifications, the next one that's on the table is all around uh, HashiCorp console. So that'll be number three. And maybe I'll do a series of videos on that once it goes GA. We'll see. Who knows? With that out of the way, let's check in. How are you? You made it. You made it, friend. You made it to Friday. That's exciting. How are you feeling? You feeling good? You, was it a productive week? I mean, I really, any week you got through right now is a win. I, that, productive or not, you were productive in the sense that you made it from the start to the finish without exploding. So uh, congratulations to you. Well done. I hope that you've got something good planned for this weekend. Mine was, uh, it was kind of going to be boring and now it's shaping up to be interesting. I'm going to a farm that's doing a sunflower festival. It'll be nice and socially distanced, but there'll be a bunch of stuff for the kids to do. Uh, they have a potato, um, uh, what you call it? Uh, a potato launcher. It's not a potato gun. It's a slingshot. And so you can like slingshot potatoes at targets. And that sounds like the kids are going to have a great time. So I'm excited for that. That's my, my big news for the weekend. Uh, so anyway, let's talk about vault certification and secrets engines. All right, I'm excited. Uh, so last time we talked about what secrets engines are and how they're basically like what makes vault worth using, because if it couldn't store and help you with secrets, it wouldn't be very good at secrets lifecycle management. Now, would it? So we talked about secrets engines and we talked about some of the most important ones that exist. And one that I sort of glossed over and didn't get into too much was the transit engine. And so that is specifically called out in the objectives, define transit engine. I think it's important that we talk about it a little bit. And I will say, so on the HashiCorp Learn site, there's a tutorial that you can go through to learn more about it. But just briefly, what's the transit engine? What is it for? The idea behind the transit engine is if you need to encrypt some piece of data, you can send it to the transit engine, it will encrypt it for you and send that encrypted data back to you. And then you can store that in whatever persistent data store you want to use. And then when you need that bit of data decrypted, you can send it back to Vault, Vault will decrypt it and send the decrypted data back to you. So that's more or less the, uh, the step of operations there. And generally speaking, you would have a single ring that's what they call it. So when you mount the transit engine, you can create rings and each ring has its own set of encryption keys. And the, the, when you are standing up your application per se, that needs to use this transit engine, you would create a ring for that application. And you would also create a policy that governs the application's access and only granted access to that ring and no other rings. That kind of makes sense. So now that application basically has encryption on demand and it doesn't have to create that thing itself. 
Transit Engine is also super fast. It's all done in memory. So Vault has no idea what the data is that's being encrypted. It gets the data, it processes it with the encryption key and sends it back to you. And none of that is persisted to permanent storage. All that happens in memory. So if you wanted to get that data again, you would have to go to wherever you're storing the encrypted data because Vault doesn't have that. So that is kind of what Transit Engine does. A few things to understand about it. One is that you can configure what type of encryption keys are being used. You can also use it to just generate random data. If you need some random data for your application or whatever you're using, you can just do that without actually submitting any information, just get random data out of it. You can also use it to create checksums. So it has a couple different functions in there. You can also rotate the encryption key that the transit engine is using, and you can just rotate it and rotate it. It maintains the previous copies of the encryption key. And when someone sends encrypted data, that encrypted data includes the version which it was encrypted with. And as long as Vault has that key, it can decrypt it. Now you can set a minimum key setting, and this may or may not show up on the exam, but it's definitely called out in the training you can set a minimum required key version. So you can say, I will only support version seven and newer or version 10 and newer. And I think you can also set it so it'll support the current minus whatever, minus four. And that means really old encrypted data is no longer going to be able to be decrypted by Vault. Now, why would you do that? There's probably some operational reasons to do that, but it's important to know that that feature is in there. I would recommend enabling the transit engine and looking at the different configuration options that are in there just so you're familiar with how they work. So that's transit engine and I, I hopefully I did it justice here so you have an understanding of what it is and why you might use it. You can mount multiples of the transit engine so you don't have to just have one instance of the transit engine. You can have it installed multiple times on different paths. That's pretty straightforward and um, the process, it's not enabled by default or anything. So you do have to enable it if you want to use the Transit Engine. So that's Transit Engine. It's basically encryption as a service offered by Vault. And you do have to be authenticated to Vault with a valid token to use it. And you, of course, you need the appropriate policies and permissions and all that kind of good stuff. So that takes care of Objective 5C, defining the Transit Engine. I think we've got that pinned down pretty well. The other objective that we needed to talk about. And we I mentioned this in the previous video, but I just wanna bring it up again because we're kind of doing these in reverse order because I think they were in a weird order to begin with. 5B is contrasting dynamic, dynamic secrets and static secrets. And this one's real easy. Dynamic secrets are generated by Vault On Demand. That's it. When you request a secret from Vault and say you're requesting AWS credentials through that secrets engine, Vault goes out and generates those AWS credentials on the fly by talking to AWS and then supplies them to you. That's dynamic. A static secrets engine just is a repository of secrets. So when you request a secret from Vault, if that secret doesn't exist, it has nothing to give you because <laughs> you are responsible for storing that. So the key value secrets engine, for instance, stores static secrets. You have to place a secret in there and then later you get it out. The final sub-objective in here is choose a secret method based on use case. And that is really gonna be down to you understanding what the different secrets engines are out there and why you might select one for a particular use case. So you'd start with what type of secret am I trying to store or retrieve from Vault? Is it a dynamic secret or a static secret? Okay, that takes me down a decision tree on what type of engine I'm going to use. Next would be, where is the secret stored? <laughs> you know, uh, is it going to be something that's stored? Uh, is it a database secret? Okay, well then I'm probably gonna use a database engine. Is it an AWS secret? Is it credentials for Microsoft Azure? Is it something to do with Active Directory? Like all of those should point you pretty easily to the secrets engine that makes the most sense. Also, what is the lifetime of the secret? That might be a question that comes up. Um, and is there a custom secrets engine that meets the needs of the use case or should I use a more generalized one? And that would be something like the key value store, which is just a generalized secrets engine for you to store values. 
So those are some of the questions you're going to want to ask. And then remember the more specialized secrets engines that are out there. We talked about them last week and just a quick reminder of the more specialized ones. So there's not specialized, but the actually, I guess, more general or weird ones. There's the key value store. You should definitely know a lot about that. There's the cubbyhole secrets engine that is enabled by default and is per token. And there's the identity one, which is the internal secrets engine used by Vault, and then the transit engine that we talked about today. So definitely know about those different secrets engines. You probably won't need to know about the provider-specific ones like AWS or Azure. Be aware of them, but you probably won't know how to configure them or necessarily how to interact with them for the certification. I mean, you probably should know how to use them in general, but for the certification, you won't. Uh, so that's everything I have for today, and that does it for the week. I will be back on Monday for uh, some professional development thoughts, and I definitely already have something in the queue for that, so stay tuned for that. But that does it for me for today. Until next